knowledge. Socrates complains that the answer Thyatetus has provided is not a definition of knowledge, knowledge itself, but examples of quote unquote knowledge of, that is separate species of knowledge. Thyatetus makes a second effort, this time using mathematical formulas to which he then applies, he then applies terms for geometry. Socrates is more pleased with this effort on Thyatetus's part and encourages him to extrapolate. Uh, when he says, go on then, you gave us a good lead just now, try to imitate your answer about the powers. There you brought together the, the many powers within a single form. Now I want you in the same way to give one single account of the many branches of knowledge. Thyatetus replies with his own misgivings about his answer. He has tried to solve the problem, but he says, I can never persuade myself that anything I say will really do. This effort to define knowledge demonstrates a method of thinking that McKeon calls problematic. The problematic method is inquiry by resolution and question. The known is used to inquire into the knowable. Its principles or starting points are reflexive. They resolve problems into pluralities of wholes, which are reflexively instances of themselves. Thyatetus's initial response to the question, what is knowledge, is to enumerate a collection of wholes, areas of knowledge, or what we today would call disciplines, a response that Socrates dismisses because it is not a definition of knowledge, but examples of knowledge of. Thyatetus, uh, his continued effort to provide evidence for uh, this answer provide, divides numbers into two classes, squares and oblongs. In effect, he is focused on specific evidence. In this case, categories of terms that are set forth in the selection as functions by which natures may be defined and classified. Squares and oblongs contribute to the definitions of length and power in terms of their functions. Thyatetus tells Socrates that he and young Socrates uh, defined under the term length, any line which produces in square an equilateral plane number, while any line which produces in square an oblong number, we defined under the term power. Some lines function to produce equilateral plane numbers, some lines function to produce powers. The first effort to answer the question, what is knowledge, is problematic in method. And while it produces a plurality of holes, which is the aim of problematic thinking, it fails to satisfy the criteria Socrates apparently has for the answer to that question. In terms of rhetoric, Thyatetus notes that his answer is unpersuasive to himself as well as to Socrates, and he doubts that any answer developed through this mode of persuasion will be satisfactory. It is interesting to note that McKeon identifies Aristotle as the exemplar of problematic thinking, although the method clearly did not originate with Aristotle. In effect, Plato refutes his student before his student has fully articulated his particular mode of philosophic inquiry. The next answer to the question, what is knowledge, directly addresses Protagoras, one of Socrates' rivals, who has a great influence on the study of rhetoric, particular rhetoric as argument, and on liberal education, <clears throat> with his pro uh, proclamation that of all things, man is the measure an axiom that resonates through the next two and a half millennia of Western culture. The answer, knowledge is perception, and the reasoning that supports it illustrate what McKeon calls the operational method. McKeon defines the operational method as debate by discrimination and postulation, dependent on theses and rules. In this mode of thought, the knower makes knowledge, whereas the problematic thinker seeks principles that lead to a plurality of subject matters the operational thinker postulates distinctions by which to discriminate actions into kinds. Its symbols or evidence are points of discrimination. They can be categories of language or action, symbols and rules of operation that are presented in types ordered by perspectives of orientation. Locating the source of knowledge in the knower calls to attention the significance of the speaker's ethos or credibility. And this section of the dialogue quickly destabilizes ethos. <clears throat> After Socrates extensively applies Heraclitus's theory of becoming to an ex explanation of sense perception, Thyatetus remarks, I really don't know, Socrates. I can't even quite see what you're getting at, whether the things you are saying are what you think yourself or whether you are just trying me out. Socrates further destabilizes ethos when he assumes Protagoras's voice to offer an extensive explanation 
and defense of the notion that someone can both <clears throat> know and not know at one and the same time. The exercise not only calls into question the reasoning used in drawing the conclusions Protagoras does, but also the degree of trust we can place in the credibility of the speaker. Socrates subsequently follows up his masquerade as Pro Protagoras with a more straightforward refutation, which both corrects the reasoning presented in this operational response to the question, what is knowledge, and restores Socrates' original credibility. Other allusions to uh, operational discourse are present here. For instance, Socrates refers to Protagoras, uh, his bag of arguments, um, and suggesting that, quote, true knowledge is determined by who debates most effectively, an area reinforced by an allusion to plausibility as well, both of which are references frequently associated with rhetoric. Throughout this section, brief moments call attention to geometry hovering about the edges. For example, when Socrates suggests that Theodorus, who is an heir to Protagoras's thought, can help rescue Protagoras's defense of the identity of knowledge and perception, Theodorus refutes him saying, uh, it is not I, you know, Socrates, but Calais, um, the son of Hi Hipponicus, who is the guardian of Protagoras's relics. As it happened, I very soon inclined away from abstract discussion to geometry. And later, Socrates says that the philosopher has little use for law courts and council chambers or any other place of public assembly, all of which are places where rhetoric is practiced. Instead, his mind pursues its winged way as Pindar says, through the universe, in the deeps beneath the earth, doing the geometry of planes, and in the heights above heaven, doing astronomy. Many scholars treat what I'm calling the last answer to the question, what is knowledge, as two answers. <clears throat> uh, and and uh, Plato Socrates uh, um, sort of uh, encourages that at the very end when he summarizes what they've done with the three uh, answers to what is knowledge. Um, I am treating them as two steps, however, in one answer, because the claim that knowledge is true judgment plus an account, which uh, many would say is the fourth answer, depends on the partial response that can, constitutes what may would call, uh, many would call the third answer or the second answer, uh, that, that true knowledge is true judgment. This answer employs what McKeon calls the logistic method, that is the two answers combined which is proof by construction and decomposition dependent on indivisible elements. Logistic thinking devises beginnings that have no parts and therefore no possible error from which composite things and images and conventions can be formed without error in simple steps. These parts are conceivable as the knowable. Logistic thinking then constructs knowledge from the elements of the knowable. The first step of this answer begins with a decomposition of the word to know. Here, Socrates employs the wax tablet analogy for memory. Whatever is impressed upon the wax, we remember and know so long as the image remains in the wax. Whatever is obl obliterated or cannot be impressed, we forget and do not know. What follows is a cataloging of what, many, what may be known and perceived, known and not perceived, unknown but perceived, and unknown and not perceived. The wax tablet analogy is eventually set aside and replaced with another analogy, namely the aviary, in which some birds are knowledge and others are ignorance. It leads then to an investigation into the difference between pos possession and having, and among teaching, learning, and knowing. In effect, Socrates is attempted to reduce judgment to its smallest, most indivisible parts. This first step concludes by throwing doubt on the notion of true judgment, it does so by introducing rhetorical situations and strategies into the moment. Socrates refers to the men called orators and lawyers. These men, I take it, he says, use their art to produce conviction, not by teaching people, but by making them judge whatever they themselves choose. Socrates asks Thyatatus if he thinks these men can properly teach. Thyatatus responds, no, I don't think they possibly could, but they might be able to persuade. Socrates concludes the section by noting that a good orator can properly persuade a jury of the truth, but the jury's acceptance of the truth through persuasion is not equivalent to their knowing the truth. In effect, the passage casts doubt on not only on knowledge as true judgment, but on rhetoric as a means of attaining knowledge. 
Whereas the first step to the answer, knowledge is true judgment, decomposed assertion, the assertion, the major premise. Uh, the second step, accompanied by an account, decomposes the supporting data or evidence, the symbols of construction or composition by which matters or materials may be transformed by reduction. The three possible meanings for account successively break down evidence into smaller and smaller bits, from atoms to protons, neutrons, and electrons, from there to neutrinos and muons. He doesn't use these terms, but I'm just using that as illustration. The first meaning is that account is a kind of vocal image. Next, it is the way to the whole for the elements and is il illustrated by the discussion of letters and syllables. Finally, an account is some mark by which the object differs from all other things. The eventual re rejection of this effort to define knowledge is a refutation not only of the logistic methods of Democritus and Euclid from classical Greece, according to McKeon anyway, but of Hobbes, Newton, Locke, Descartes, Spinoza and Leibniz. Uh, that's McKeon's assertion again. I would add of Saussure and structuralist linguistics and post-structuralist rhetoricians as well. <clears throat> the three methods of thinking, problematic, operational, and logistic, ultimately fail to adequately answer the question, what is knowledge? However, there is a fourth method that in the case of this and perhaps all of Plato's dialogues, typifies his uses of and attitudes toward rhetoric and persuasive language and indicates the, po the proper response to the question, what is knowledge? McKeon's fourth method is the dialectical method, which he defines as assimilation and exemplification dependent on changeless models. Knowledge is the objective which the knower seeks and approximates. Dialectic operates on comprehensive principles, assimilating all things, thoughts, symbols, and actions into an inclusive whole formed by an englobing principle. It interprets the world ontologically, assimilating what seems to be the case to a reality which transcends and corrects appearances and assimilates the knowable into knowledge. It is not, however, that the end of the dialectic method presents us with knowledge. Rather, it is a method that moves us toward knowledge by moving through various efforts to assimilate things, thoughts, words, and actions, and to exemplify their understanding. Knowledge is not an object and an end. It is a process that exists and is made present, at least in this world, only as long as the knower continues to seek it. Rhetoric does not, cannot bring us to knowledge, but it may contribute to the process by providing categories to be discarded, assertions of credibility to be doubted, and differences to be uh, rejected. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Up next, we have uh, Christopher Jeffreda. Is that right? Yes. We are. Okay. Plato, sophist, in one of his later dialogue, one of his later dialogues, concerns itself inter alia with the character of the sophist. For Benjamin Jowett, the sophist appears as master of the art of illusion. He shuns the nature of true teacher. The problem of influence described here is no less real in ancient Athens than in Washington, DC. While certain classes of influence can hardly be classified as benign, conspiracy theories, disinformation, etc., American jurisprudence limits restrictions on free speech to cases of imminent law lawless action, Brandenburg versus Ohio, or clear and present danger, Schenck versus United States. It is difficult to attach blame in an American political crisis. In a case where the dialectical net cannot catch an unscrupulous actor, rhetoricians may turn to Plato's sophist for illegal solutions to the problem of domestic terrorism. These are broadly methods of purification. Note one, uh, purification is no idle concept for the ancient, ancient Greeks. It is related to katharmos, which was a cleansing of emotions prior to going before the gods. Miasma is the name for the pollutants that are cleansed. Miasma is present when one is occupied with matters of the body. Plato's purification is as many-sided as the sophist himself. For the Eleatic stranger, to purify is to throw away the worse and preserve the better. When a speaker thinks that he is saying something and is really saying nothing, the philosopher will help him separate being from non-being. The speaker's contradictions are revealed, frustrating him 
and turning his anger inward. Purification reveals the sophist in his guise as illusionist, a painter, a mimic, a magician. By these arts, says the Eleatic stranger, our soul is led to think falsely. End quote. Only does, not only does Alenkis educate the sophist, successful defense against his arts limits any negative influence on his pupils. Purification humbles a teacher so that he will not appear to be all wise either to his students or to him or herself. Referring to the spinning of wool, the stranger argues that purification is the separation of like from unlike. It was not lost on Plato that this involves a process of selection. Because the means of division are personal, it is not easy to firmly ground them in a basis that others will share. Note two. Um, Jowett, who describes Plato's division as a form of abscissio infinity, notes the many cases where Plato himself admits the difficulty in division, among them, Phaedrus, Philobus, and the Statesman. Purification is Plato's response to the Parmenides problem. Parmenides, the founder of the Eleatic school, argues that speaking of non-being makes it into being. For him, multiplicity and change are not real. The sophist finds oneness to be an ally, for he does not have to consider the complexity of relationships that way, especially those that refute him. The Eleatic stranger sums up the Parmenides problem thus, quote, keep your mind from this way of inquiry from never will, will you show that not being is, end quote. You get the sophist to reject monism and non-being is not simple, but this pedagogical aim is a fair summary of whether verification has been successful. In the U.S., I'm going to speed up a little. In the U.S., purification typically runs into three problems, modality, complicity, and imitation. A modern modality such as Twitter leaves moral and intellectual foundations in a debilitated state. Plato's methods tend to rely on normative ideas such as evil, vanity, desire for symmetry, deformity, acquisition of intelligence, injustice, etc. It's not at all clear that this everyday language is self-evident or can be made uh, or can be transmitted within the purification framework. Purification is also, uh, or within uh, the uh, purification modality. Purification is also exceedingly difficult because of complicity. That is, modality is distributed, morality is distributed through group identifications rather than in individual souls, which makes virtue well nigh unattainable. Uh, if no claim to virtue is possible, then it is hard to know who is assigned to educate whom. Thirdly, the sophist is not so easily called an imitator or image maker. Many have said that 20th century thought has universalized the image and made it an ontological function common to all. But Plato addresses this as a challenge when the logic of image, aka geometry, seems to solve problems produced by the realm of number. Examples of ontological images may include implicit bias, privilege, class politics, um, etc. Um, one note that I missed um, with the, the settling of uh, morality within souls, you can see um, the Timaeus there. Um, Stephanus numbers uh, 30A to 30B. So. With uh, modality, complicity, and, and imitation serving as obstacles to rhetoric, sophistry is not so easily identified and purified. This trio, as I will show in the next section, tends to enable monistic discourses. Each denies duality. The sophist takes cover in monism. His unified world presumes no superfluous or unhelpful aspects, no non-being. Therefore, his arguments cannot be trimmed or expanded. Despite this difficulty, sophist may yield hints for how to move forward with purification. This section is a modality. Um, and uh, I have a note here. I have uh, called certain digital modalities monistic. Um, however, Vial and Stimler seem to have, uh, to have arrived there before me. They write that, quote, human reality is a digital centered hybrid environment made of mixed systems and matters constantly interlinked 
that tend to form a single continuous multi-material artifactual substance. Um, this one, uh, end quote, this oneness is not so accommodating to online guests. Um, the Timaeus also comes to mind. Creatures are said to be divided into portions that are the same, but different. Stephanus numbers 30 C to D. However, this is an act of consciousness that the monism of vile and stimular seems not to allow. Modality. The great test of American speech norms is how violence and terror are deliberated. In our open society, the state does not have a legitimate um, monopoly on violence. There is space for relation in public life, such as the 2019 George Floyd protests. Violence against persons is acceptable in certain domains. Castle Doctrine, Guantanamo Bay, competitions sanctioned by state athletic commissions. Violence becomes a necessary subject to the extent that some folks face a greater share. Um, distributive justice is really at stake in um, discussions about violence. So we, we must talk about it um, and subject ourselves to, um, to the modalities um, where we can talk about it. To re, uh, remake a monist modality into a pluralist modality, uh, it is necessary to challenge the seamless nature of the interaction as we see with violence stimuli. This is done by mediating the modality, calling attention to its influence, thus paving the way to discuss the various influences that the modality is known to have on behavior. Um, this is a natural way to begin purification of influence more generally. Um, the Eliotic stranger makes a useful distinction when he discusses the art of exchange. Uh, there are those works that are distinguished as the sale of a man's own, own productions, while another, which is an exchange of works of others. Purification should become easier if the creative and authentic work is revealed to really be part of a system of production, uh, for example, a cable news show. Furthermore, it is best to situate the system of production as one that positions its subjects as needy. Laura Candioto has noted that a key aspect of Platonic Alenkis was shame, a quote, transformative experience that is crucial for the therapeutic dynamics, which brings about the inward anger I mentioned in the first section. Um, judgments about labor seem easier to make than judgments about Plato's other twofold divisions. And I think I've been reading for a while, so I'm going to go ahead and pass the next person. Um, and then maybe I will work some of the rest of this into the Q&A. You have about seven minutes if you want it. Oh no, that that's okay. I I feel like I've I've been uh I've been reading forever, and that's really the section that um that I wanted to focus on because to be honest, the other two sections as I re read them and reread them, there's not as much there as I think uh, what I read to you. So maybe um maybe uh, if anyone wants to ask me a question later, maybe there's a chance for me to develop um you know, the modality argument. Okay, okay. Thank you then. No, thank you. Right. Okay, next we have uh, Christina de Leon uh, Menjivar um, uh, on virtue in online spaces, a platonic exploration of culpability and chaos. Christina? Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to share my screen because when Roberto did that yesterday, it was very easy for me to follow. So um, I'm gonna do the same. Okay, so uh, virtue in online spaces, a, a platonic exploration of culpability and chaos. Online political discourse has long been at a boiling point, but between the COVID-19 pandemic and a bitter election season, our worst fears regarding social media use have come to pass, especially in the realm of political discourse. The political situation is so contentious and dangerous that government officials have formally acknowledged the issue several, the issue several numerous times. Late last fall, a Senate hearing was convened to question major social media tech executives about their content moderation policies. In that hearing, Senator Ed Markey admonished social media tech executives stating, your algorithms are promoting online spaces that foster political violence. Senator Amy Klobuchar also addressed the problem, stating to executives, the way I look at it, more divisiveness, more time on the platform, um, more time on the platform, the company makes more money. Does that bother you what it's done to our politics? 
These, these examples capture the politics of blame at work here. Notice your algorithms. From a governmental standpoint, at least on face value, it appears that social media executives are mostly to blame for divisive hate speech while users are only acknowledged in passing. By not foregrounding user behavior when discussing this issue, we may mistakenly underestimate user responsibility. Of course, there are numerous laws now that address these issues, but the reality is that when we talk about divisive political discourse, the conversation time and time again lays blame on social media, specifically its executives and algorithms and its faulty or dismissive policies. In order to get a handle on our politics and be able to engage in meaningful discourse, users must learn to address their irresponsibility and acknowledge the consequences of their actions, not just socially, but also within themselves. Plato's Republic holds some important answers to address this issue, lending us a deeper understanding of what motivates such speech and how it can be addressed. Through the lens of the Republic, the agents of online political rhetoric are not so much systems, but individual souls, more particularly individual tyrannical souls acting as if they were invisible. The tyrannical soul's inability to moderate his own opinions and interactions inhibits productive political discourse and the ability to attain true clarity and contentment. By turning to Plato, we can begin to understand how corruption occurs and recognize our own pitfalls. And that is the first step towards rehabilitation. Perhaps more importantly, the Republic provides guidance about when we can act politically and following that guidance, while a lofty ideal, could result in a healthier political dialogue. Anonymity and the soul. Through the, throughout the Republic, the state of individual souls is described as analogous to the state of the city. This analogy suggests that justice and a healthy society begin at the individual level, which is typically not the understanding in US political discourse. In our society, accountability and responsibility are expected from celebrities and institutional representatives, but hardly do individual users expect to be held accountable for their words and actions. This belief is captured in cancel culture. Cancel culture is defined as a modern internet phenomenon where a person is ejected from influence or frame by questionable actions. For example, when Kathy Griffin posted a picture of her holding a bloody severed Trump head on her Twitter account, she fell prey to cancel culture. However, for private people, especially because of online anonymity, cancel culture is not such a looming threat. Anonymity coupled with a global platform to relay opinions and ideas result in a rhetorical environment that allows for the worst in our souls to be displayed to the world seemingly without consequence. Stephen Marsh, a writer for the New York Times, touches on this point, writing that everyone in the digital space is, at one point or another, exposed to online monstrosity, one of the consequences of the uniquely contemporary condition of facelessness. Yet while our faces may be obscured, what is still visible are our souls, and facelessness allows for a more transparent look into the true state of one's being. For Plato, the soul is the means through which we understand, reason with, and respond to life. In online spaces, our, soul are, our souls are bared to the world through our words, actions, and even inaction, for example, by choosing not to engage. What our words show in online spaces is that this facelessness bears a tyrannical soul, much like the one described in the Republic and the consequences of a tyrannical soul are much worse than anything cancel culture can dish out. Online tyranny. According to one view of human nature, as described in book two, acting justly not only requires intrinsic motivation, it also requires the ability to recognize and overcome one's natural tendencies and characteristics. Most often, these tendencies to act unjustly are checked by natural instincts when in the presence of other human beings, when we are not invisible to others. However, in online settings, these innate, these innate social checks are lost through virtual interfaces that replace human faces. Plato writes, no one is willingly just, but only when compelled to be so. Men do not take it to be a good, to be a good for them in private, since whenever each supposes he can do injustice, he does it. Indeed, all men suppose injustice is far more to their private profit than justice. In our online discourse, messages are created and delivered in a private sphere where the profits of indulging in harmful discourse perpetuate a view of ideas and self that fails to be critical and reasonable. Messages formed with no intent to create a dialectical conversation simply bounce off the virtual echo chamber walls. Perhaps what is worse than the echo chamber that results in this, that this behavior, 
is that this behavior feeds a soul trending towards a tyrannic state. In this state, a soul begins to lose its ability to reason, moving further away from clarity and proper judgment. Often, those who engage in hateful political speech online often claim to be in control and bearing truth, much like those belonging to QAnon. Yet while control is claimed because they are in an inflamed tyrannical state, they are in anything but they are anything but in control. A tyrant's life, Socrates says, is like a man with a body that is sick and without control of itself, compelled to spend his life not in a private station instead of keeping himself to himself, but contesting and fighting with other bodies. For groups that thrive on online political hate and conspiracy, war metaphors are often used in their speech which transforms their rhetoric into a purposeful cause that one can rally behind. This medical, metaphorical language emboldens the speech and transforms it into action. This action, when employed, can only result in individual and collective harm. What tyrannical online speech illustrates is a soul gorging on its own hate in order to satisfy its dispositions by way of the metaphor of war, normalizing this embattled state. Remedying the discourse. In the Republic, Sofrosine, which can be tri translated as moderation, is listed as one of the four virtues of a city and is defined as a kind, of moder uh, a, a kind of harmony that transcends all social classes. Plato writes, moderation actually stretches throughout the whole from top to bottom of the entire scale. This unanimity is moderation and accord of worse and better according to nature as to which must rule in the city and in each one. Again, extending the soul and city analogy, Plato writes that social and political harmony begins with the moderation of the individual soul. The tripartite soul of Plato includes the rational, the spirited, the spirited and the appetitive. And he argues that only when these parts of the soul are in balance can we engage in political behavior. He doesn't let these three classes in the soul meddle with each other, but he really sets his own house in, in good order and rules himself, Plato writes. Then and only then he acts and if he does act in some way, either concerning the acquisition of money or the care of the body or something political or concerning private contracts. But the question remains, how does one cultivate and assess the moderation of one's soul? Ironically, the environment afforded to us in the online sphere is an ideal space for cultivating moderation precisely because it is perceived as a private sphere. If behavior can be moderated in this space, which is ripe with opportunities to gorge the tyrannic parts of the soul, then there is hope yet. However, that moderation is first achieved by acknowledging what the tyrannical soul looks like and understanding its consequences, both individually and collectively. Dialogue must engage the rational part of the soul and the appetitive must remain in its place. The tr this translates into social media behavior as either choosing not to engage or creating a true dialogue that engages our dialectical sense. When we acknowledge that indulging the tyrannical self voids the opportunity for true clarity, we can become critical about our own ideas and understandings of the world, knowing that these harmful tendencies have corrupted the lens through which we interpret the workings of our democracy. Once this state is achieved, truth can be pursued and our souls will achieve a state of health that will help diffuse virtue more broadly. That's it. Thank you, Christina. Um, <clears throat> that was very good. Um, our final speaker today is Dr. David Metzger, and he, his, the title of his speech is, or his paper is Math, Metaphor, and Numerical Satisfaction in Thyatatus. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Metzger. Whoop, 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 whoop. It says I'm muted. Now you're good. We can hear you yeah. now. Yes. All right. Yeah. Oh, but, hang on just a second. Could you, uh. Oh, that is your screen. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I thought I'm going to try that trick. I, I think that was really. I I wish I had done it. <laughs> uh, now that I think about it, and I, I thought I would pay more attention to the the text, but it was a very interesting thing where the. What yeah. I was seeing, and so I, I I'll give it a shot, and I and I have maybe I could even show my diagram. Yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Discussion, well, I guess I can start with this one. Uh, Plato's Titatus is often and rightly summarized as, as an examination of the following propositions. 
knowledge is perception, knowledge is true judgment, knowledge is true judgment with an account. Examinations of these propositions, however, rarely take into account Plato's use of metaphor, not only to charm, but also to establish the contours and conceptual ground for the symbolic satisfactions and crises that emerge within his propositional work. Discussions of number explicitly appear at two decisive moments in Thytatus. Toward the beginning of the dialogue, the kinds of questions and answers prompted by Thytatus' study of geometry serve as models for the kinds of questions, answers that Socrates asks of Thytatus. Later, the question of how one might explain the production of a correct and incorrect calculation, 5 plus 7 equals 11, 5 plus 7 equals 12, becomes a test of the validity and descriptive power of one metaphor for a soul's way of knowing and not knowing, the wax tablet, and a prompt for introducing another, the pigeon coop of the soul. Consider the following exchange between Socrates and Thytatus. Socrates, well now, take the case where a man is considering five and seven within himself. I don't mean seven men and five men or anything of that sort but five and seven themselves. The records, as well allege, in that waxen block, things amongst which it is not possible that there should be false judgment. Suppose he is talking to himself about them and asking himself how many they are. Do you think that in such a case it has ever happened that one man thought they were 11 and said so, while another thought and said that they were 12? Or do all men say and all men think that they are 12. In the very first sentence of this passage, Socrates introduces and troubles the way some of us first learn to think about numbers. A number we were asked to imagine is like a collection of things that we could count. We see the following, or the following. We would then assign a number or a unit name to each of those shapes. For the sake of our engagement, let's assume these shapes are M&Ms. Notice how Socrates takes our, away our M&Ms. He says, we should consider the case of five and seven themselves. What do we do? Do we work within a metaphor where our five M&Ms are equivalent to five yummy units, YUs? If so, then we still must assemble our piles of five yummy units and seven yummy units and then count them. If we are not distracted or eat one of them, counting is such exhausting work, then we might correctly answer that five YUs plus seven YUs equals 12 YUs. But we will not have begun to consider five and seven themselves. The five and seven that might be within us in a way that five and seven M&Ms cannot be. For all of us, I would imagine there was a time when adding five and seven together to make 12 no longer required counting. Whether through familiarity or habit, we simply remembered the answer. If pressed to provide a proof, we would run to, to the store to get some M&Ms or we would need to summon another metaphor. And I suggest one here, the metaphor of numbers are points on a line. We would even imagine an ant who after walking five blocks and then seven blocks, looks up and sees that she is at the corner of 12th Street. And well, let's not worry about the cross streets just yet. Let us say our aunt walks five blocks and then seven, and then look, she has arrived at block 12. Remove the whatness of 12 blocks, and then we can confidently say 12 is the answer. At precisely the moment when we either remove the chocolate center of whatness or out of familiarity, we say five plus seven equals 12, Socrates pulls out the wax tablet. Five and seven themselves, he says. The records as well allege in that waxen block things amongst which it is not possible that there should be false judgment. On our wax block, we may have a deep and lasting impression of five and seven. Do we also have such an impression of 12? and or do we have an impression for the expression five and seven equals 12? Thytatus anticipates this question when he says that people often make calculation errors when working with larger numbers or with large numbers. 
It may be true that through practice with the dip, we can see an image of our dear friend 12 in the faces of five and seven. The snub nose is always a giveaway, but Thytatus asks us to consider numbers, larger numbers with whom we are making our first acquaintance. So may I introduce you to 1,999,999 and his brother, 1,999,999. Unless we see that the two of them are really the twins, two million minus their two mustaches, it might take us a while to recall the answer that we no doubt possess, but we may not have on hand. To its credit, the wax block metaphor underscores the role of mem memory in calculation. After all, it is easier to remember that 1,999,000 is 2 million minus one. So 2 million plus 2 million equals 4 million. Subtract two ones will give us the answer we are looking for. The wax tablet too is itself an aid to memory. And one of them dating from the second century CE and currently in the British Museum was even equipped with a multiplication table carved into one side of its frame. But the wax tablet metaphor does not capture the agility with which we can transport, transform the objects of memory, especially when some objects of memory like number can help us to recall something new, like the sum of two numbers whose answer we have not already imprinted, impressed or memorized. Another difficulty appears if we borrow some language and a little attitude from the Republic's discussion of number. The wax block in our interactions with it might also reduce our calculations to a series of mechanical activities where the techne of calculation is reduced to the mechanics of an abacus. I want to recall a question prompted by our wax tablet. Do we also have such an impression for 12 and or do we have an impression for five and seven equals 12? This answer, although not directly, this question rather, although not directly expressed, prompts a change in metaphor from wax block to pigeon coop as the dialogue attempts to capture more fully the distinction between having and or possessing knowledge that is implied by that question. Socrates. Now look here. Is it possible in this way to possess knowledge and not have it? Suppose a man were to hunt wild birds, pigeons or something, and made an aviary for them at his house and look after them there. Then, in a sense, I suppose we might say he has them all the time, because of course he possesses them. But in another sense, he has none of them. It is only that he's acquired a certain power in respect of them because he has got them under his control in an enclosure of his own. That is to say, he has the power to hunt for anyone he likes at any time and take and have it whenever he chooses and let it go again. And this he can do as often as he likes. That's from 197C. But by the time we reach 197E, this pigeon coop has been transformed into a jar, as in the sentence, we must assume that while we are children, this receptacle jar vessel, agos, is empty, kenos, and we must understand that the birds represent the varieties of knowledge. The container metaphor will eventually be deemed insufficient. The pigeon coop with its ignorance birds and knowledge birds leads to the idea that true judgment is all about data, if that is the case, data collectors are never wrong in their analyses or judgments. They simply make true judgments regarding the data they have on hand. But I think there's more in this, in these empty children, a throwback to the motion argument. When children mature, they change. Their emptiness as knowledge jars is in fact filled with something. That is, the nothing at one level is a something at another. One metaphor's symbolic crisis is another metaphor's principle of generation. If we needed to link this core text with a STEM initiative for the purposes of an NSF grant, 
I think Plato has done much of the work for us in this little sentence. We must assume that while we are children, this receptacle jar vessel is empty and we must understand that the birds represent the varieties of knowledge. While the philosophy understood only as a sequence of proposition flows around the metaphors of the wax tablet and the pigeon coop, so the history of mathematics moves from number as line to number as container and although I didn't address the subject today, number is picture. Think Thytatus's oblong and square numbers. And that's not even half of the story. Even now, as irrational numbers, even now, as irrational numbers await a more mature Thytatus's treatment, not to mention the clamor of zero, the empty jar, and infinity, the race of Achilles and the tortoise, as they demand entrance into the rooms of Plato's dialogue. Of course, we won't describe our potentially funded project that way. Rather, we would say there is a productive and interesting journey from Plato's Thytatus to Richard Dedekind's 1858 pamphlet, Continuity with Irrational Numbers, which, by the way, begins with the discussion of Heraclitus, Plato's Thytatus, and the mapping of discontinuous and continuous spaces, spaces in series and mathematics. Now, even if you are not convinced that Plato's wax tablet and pigeon coop are whimsical allusions to the conceptual machine of mathematics, I hope that I've made you look at Plato's metaphors in a different way. With Plato's metaphors, we are dealing with what Hans Weihinger might have called a peculiar kind of logical product. They are mental structures productive in the ways Lakoff and Johnson's conceptual metaphors are, but in Plato's metaphors, we can still witness the birth pangs of a concept. Logical things wink as they will, wink most when wind bags, if not wind eggs, wins. Thank you, David. Okay, so, we now have lots of time for uh, discussion and questions and comments. Does anybody have something? You want to begin? I have a. I, I always have a question. I have a question for Christina. Sure. Um, because I'm really interested in um, the move toward the end of the paper where you're um, you <clears throat> toward the association of Sofrasune with harmony. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of Roberto's comment or explanation yesterday about harmony as being, um, oh, shoot. Uh, perfect tension, wasn't it? But it's a tension yeah. in, I, I was going to stick tension and rest because a contradiction, they draw me, they're like, a, I'm like a moth to a flame. I <laughs> love, uh, but how did you say that, Roberto? Because it's I need it for my question. <laughs> <laughs> Gladly. Well, uh, what I what I was saying yesterday was that harmony in Greek means perfect tension or tension at rest, and that that uh, is that the sixth string of a guitar plays E, sounds E, and it only sounds E if you have the tension to sound it like E. And what Christina put there is is a a, a very good text uh, because it's precisely where Plato, I think, uh, assembles all his psychological theory with harmony. But now go to the, your question, David. <laughs> yeah, it has to do with. Uh, could you say more about Sophrosune as a, a tension? Yeah at rest or a stable, maybe I would probably say a stable tension and how that might be part of a political project. I think it comes down to being able to balance your response to what you are mm -hmm. perceiving. Um, Obviously, we cannot control our environment. The only thing we can control is our response, much like stoic thinking, right? Um, so I think that's where Sofrosine will help with that because you're 
it's like you're achieving a mental balance. Um, and only when you are in that state, can you think clearly, can you begin to move towards, towards truth, towards clarity? Um, yeah. it, is the category all men, but I'll just say all people, mm -hmm. it, d does that emerge then out of this individual work on the soul i mean either as it's at that moment um moments of, of where we've achieved so for Sunni that we participate in this larger larger political category all all people or all citizens um hmm. well I'm not, and this may not be answering your question, but I think it just comes down to the idea that I was explaining this to someone last night. And I said, you know, if you want to achieve, like, you know, everyone talks about world peace, right? We all want world peace. We're always praying for it or asking for it in some way. But the reality is we want everyone else to do that. We don't want to do it ourselves. But world peace starts with having peace in yourself. Mm. And I think that kind of thinking is analogous to what Plato is saying with um, with moderation. You want to achieve moderation as a whole, you start with yourself. Um, you can't demand that of other people and not do it yourself. Um. Yeah, and if I may jump in here, uh, that's precisely, I believe, what Plato is asking of everyone in Republic and at the end, as you cited, uh, the tyrant. And moderation, just to finish with this musical metaphor that I love, <laughs> is what Plato is trying to explain us there, I think, is that if we don't, if we aren't able to have moderation, we won't be able to have wisdom because every, uh, every balance starts with moderation. And it's like, you cannot imagine a guitar. If you have one string out of tune, all the song sounds terrible. In fact, you don't have a song. Mm -hmm. Just like if you don't have moderation, you don't have a just soul, which is the aim for uh, Plato is looking for. And that's why he says that uh, moderation is a type of harmony because it tenses all the soul so that with moderation, then you have courage and then you have wisdom and all together you get justice. Mm -hmm. That's what I think it goes. And it starts with, with, uh, with everyone, with ourselves, because the state is, it is but a reflection of our characters and desires. Mm -hmm. so, it is, so, so it is productive of both the individual and also the all people. Mm -hmm. And there's another thing I would like to uh, to comment on Christina, Christina's work because I, I found it really interesting. This cancel culture, this tyranny we're living today, and I believe there's a there's there's a plenty uh, matter to analyze there. If we use this democracy, tyranny, Plato explains in Republic 8 and 9. And I even tend to see the tyrant, the tyrant Plato is describing as a narcissist. Someone that, and that's, I, I believe something terrible and narcissists don't have a cure because they are not able to see they are wrong. So that's what Plato is trying to uh, aware of. Watch out, you may get into tyranny and social media today and this cancel culture and all this stuff going on in the world is driving everyone towards tyranny thanks to a democratic principle, which is everyone can keep their opinion. I think we came dangerously close to that um, with, with our uh, recently uh, departed president, quite honestly, I, you know, I mean, he, 
he is the exemplar of narcissism um, and cannot see, will not accept when he's wrong, right? Um, and the impulse towards tyranny was just all too obvious to me anyway. Yeah. Paige, you had something you wanted to add? Yes, um, for Christopher and, and Christina, and really for everybody, um, but Christopher was uh, using, Christopher, are you with me? I am. Yeah. Um, you were talking about when you were discussing uh, modality, uh, Twitter was your um, example of, of a modality. And uh, then you, you went on to, to suggest that, that you know, Twitter is a, is a dangerous thing. And I think it, it's related to what we, we were just saying. Um, but there's, there's something that I was, I was struggling with um, if I was confusing the way you were using the word modality and um, if you were using it in a, in a way we, we don't use it every day. Uh, I guess another way of saying it is, you know, is the problem in Twitter as a set of algorithms or is it somewhere else? Is it, in other words, who's, <laughs> Is Twitter the, as a modality really the problem? Maybe. Uh, for me, uh, it, it wasn't uh, the idea of, of Twitter um, as a modality. I, I could have used um, anything from um, MySpace to, um, to Snapchat, uh, but anything uh, that creates a sort of um, seamless experience. Um, makes it hard for the mind to be simultaneously um, engaged with uh, what it's doing and also also critical um, and uh, no different really in the same way that I can uh, yell at my TV if I'm watching The Walking Dead when a character um, is about to you know wander into a zombie filled uh, area you know uh, of course the TV is not going to yell back no. Mm -hmm. So the problem with those other modalities is they they let you yell back. Uh, they they do, and, and I would say too um, that there are layers. Um, there are there's hardware and there's software that are both immersive. Wouldn't you say, Paige, that uh, that Twitter really is just um, an app that is used on a phone, which is itself addictive because it can give you anything you want um, and it will ask nothing of you. I, I just listened to, I guess, uh, last, well, within the last five or six days, I listened to a podcast from radio by Radio Lab on free speech and how our definition of what free speech is has changed in just the last hundred years. Um, and they trace it back to Oliver Wendell Holmes actually changing his opinion as to what that is. Um, and it seems to me that our notion of free speech is president, uh, premised on the idea of rational speech. Um, and, but we've never, we being sort of the collective community have never really problematized what exactly that would mean for 300 million people, you know, to be rational and how we could evaluate that and as long as it was, as long as the media, as we know it, was one way, I don't think that was as much of an issue. Um, but now when, with these, with the back and forth, you know, with, with statement and response on such a wide scale, it becomes um, highly problematic. I don't have an answer for that. But it could leave the other way. I mean, it could, it could foster dialectical it could, yes, right. But it, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Or it hasn't anyway. Yeah. Right? Maybe there's some, some sort of echo, echo chamber or hall of mirrors effect mm -hmm. that, 
that makes people so crazy? I don't yeah, know. Because I don't know that the answer would be going back to the to free speech uh, defined in such a way that we can have sedition acts where you can't speak against the government. Right. Can't right? have that. Yeah. Is it the, the means, it's essentially, a, 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 you're talking about modalities as, as, as simply a means of, it's like move, moving the message without interrogating it in some way. I asked that, it seems to be a simple question based on what, what's emerged, but there was something you said, Christopher, that really caught my attention. And, and that's where you started talking about a, a seamless experience so that it's, it appeared to be a continuous, you might say, a, a continuous mapping of one space onto another so that the discontinuity between the two spaces is not apparent. So, and, and I was thinking, you know, of those old uh, stories, uh, Plutarch has one of them about the, about, um, Competi art competitions, you know, and and, and um, you know, and the the, the person, uh, you know, who wins the, the art competition is, um, well, I get it was a battle between Zeuxis and what is it, uh, Zeuxis and me, the other one, this maybe, you know. So um, I think uh, Zeuxis. Uh, painted a vine and some and some grapes on it and and some birds came and tried to eat them oh this is wonderful this is wonderful Horacios, and they say and now for your contribution to the to the competition and and he he just uh, does the van of white kind of mm -hmm -hmm. and uh they go over to a curtain and they try to pull the cord and guess what it's a painting of a cord ah Horacios wins he wins because you know, Zuxis fooled animals, but Horacios, he, feel, he fooled human beings. But how is that possible? What you're doing is that you're mapping one space onto another. And fooling someone is making this mapping absolutely seamless. So that you think that it is um, the case. So I was wondering, are you talking about the... We, that if the problem with the modality is that it could be seamless, then it's covering over a discontinuity between two things? It's, uh, it's covering over probably a good many things. There's a lot to, uh, lot to think about there, but um, I would say it's covering up your inputs, um, your time, no, your energy. It does well, that. We're certainly in the realm of McLuhan. You know, the medium is the message that we, modality suggests that it's doing something for us. It's a, it, it's a serving thing. And I, I guess, what perhaps Christopher you're saying is that you know it's not serving, it's it's ruling. It's we have a question from Rose that I want to get to. It's in the chat. Yeah. But, but before that, I just want to say this morning I I uh, in my rhetoric class we covered uh, Chaim Perlman, and he uh, defines argument as uh, the study of discursive techniques. Uh, showing us, uh, allowing us to induce or increase the mind's adherence to the theses presented for assent. So it, you know, again. Do you repeat that? Yeah. Uh, argument is the study of discursive techniques allowing us to induce or increase the mind's adherence to the theses presented for their assent. You know, and I think. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, that we have these different modalities, these different means of, of uh, um, 
inducing adherence that's that we, we can't we can't explain them rationally and I think that was what he was wrestling with anyway right coming out of World War II um, what happened to rationality well maybe it never was there in the first place instead we have these and I, I may not be using the term modality the same way you are Christopher but that's what it, it appears to me Does that make sense? I, I... It, it does. Uh, I, I mean, I'm thinking um, in terms of um, whether if somebody consents to something that they don't know they're consenting to, is it a, a scent at all or is it, um, you know, just manipulation? If you, you know, study, you focus group, what will keep somebody addicted to Candy Crush, to um the facebook news feed by putting the most controversial stuff for the person at the top if you study that stuff and then you make it a project to keep someone there so you can get more advertising dollars it's hard for me to see cooperation there i use cooperation in a sense synonymously but i'd be curious it's been a while since reading perelman since the summer so i forget how he's using that that word um, um. It, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Oh, my, my sense of Perelman was he was an amazing guy, really nice guy, and he wouldn't want a scent that anybody wouldn't yield him voluntarily. That may, that may be, I, I don't know about him in particular necessarily, but the way he's, the, what he has to say about a scent and adherence is I think highly applicable right now. That, you know, because one of the things he says about facts are that facts become facts only when uh, an audience consents to view them as facts. And, you know, and the, one of the things we talked about today was, you know, if you talk about global climate change um, to a certain segment of the population, it doesn't matter, the more facts you give them on global cl climate change, the angrier they get, right? And the more entrenched their thinking becomes and the, uh, the more opposed they become. Um, he may be, you may be right that he's, he's that way, but I think also um, his, I guess taking into account what you're saying is I would say that, that his, uh, his analysis of where we are rhetorically is probably highly more accurate than I, than I would have um, considered not too long ago. Um, but it's also, uh, not where he necessarily would want it to be. So, um, not to change radically, but let's, if you wanna look at the chat, there's a question from, from Rose um, about math and harmony. She says, uh, uh, do, we, do we think that learning math on any, any level, but certainly on the level of metaphor for how we come to know what we know, enable us to overlay that understanding to harmony or self-correction to balance in our ethical selves? How does math, music, logic make us more fully moral actors or does it just make us happy? Rose, I don't think it makes you happy. It doesn't make me happy, not math anyway. Hmm. Well, yeah, so, so part of what Rose's question is something that I implied, but I, I, I didn't. Um, True just actually say is that uh, I actually am I began to suspect from from my reading of the citatus that some of the difficulty that uh, uh, folks have with mathematics may be that they are it has to do with the, the moment at which the, the math moves from one metaphor to the next and that we're trying to use one metaphor that we we recalled, which could be that number is a collection of objects. Adding is essentially move, adding this one collection to another doesn't always jive with the notion of, of the line. So for example, what, what I would call a symbolic crisis is um, the 
the, the concern uh, over, you know, in Plato's time, the concern over irrational numbers. Part of it, the reason that it, I think it, it's a problem is that you is that you can't actually identify them as a. They didn't want to identify them on, on a particular kind of of. Um, of number line, they couldn't identify them as a particular point. They merely approached a particular point that they wanted to identify with, uh, with the number. So then they were thinking, well, wh what is it uh, then? So at that moment, I would say we, we need a, a different metaphor for number. And, and you actually start to see it, uh, Plato starting to cough it up with the notion of, of peros. You know, the, the notion of a limit, and then of course the word for infinity, the apparent is that which doesn't seem to have a, a limit. I mean, I think in that moment we see him trying uh, or see an example of, 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 of a metaphor trying um, to emerge, but, but, it, but it hasn't. Um, in terms of the, the relationship between um, mathematics and um, and the good, um, I, I think you might be able to tell an interesting story about the good, and I think actually Plato does it, in terms of the one. You just have to deal with the problem. I mean, what is the, what is the, the fascinating problem that calls for a new metaphor about the one, which is itself a metaphor? <laughs> The good is the one. Well, what is it? I mean, well, is the but did we solve the problem of whether one is actually a number or whether it's a unit? Because a three is three ones. A four is you know two million is two million ones. But it's a whole bunch of other things. These ones seem to be flying about or flying in these little bird cages. Uh, of number and they get together and sometimes they're two and sometimes they're three, but they're also uh, uh, one. And so the idea of harmony, which intimately is linked with uh, with music and actually I, I would say in this case, because I, we don't really have, I don't think we have a sense of major and minor chords or at least what I, think of in terms of of harmony or a way or a particular structure to, to music, it might be better to say in tuneness rather than uh, harmony. That is the note uh, uh, finds it, it, its place. Uh, and, and I certainly could know from, from what little, well, my experience with with music is that I know that I know a piece when I, let's say I'm singing my tenor part when somebody is not singing my part, but I can hear it. And I, it's not because, and it's not, wasn't the experience of I memorize this piece and I am going to go, I know that I know we, we go, I have to sing an E and then I know I have to sing a G and then I have, no, I have to sing a, a C and then I, you don't do that. You, in all these notes, you can hear that part because there is that the place for that part. That that note that I have to sing is is right there given all these other notes. Is that what I, I, I think that, that that's a beautiful for me, I like that as a metaphor for the good because it it, it makes makes the good something that can move. Well, I like I'm a member of the motion party, but anyway, the it, it makes the good something that you can hear in different situations. W where is it in the, where is it given these other um, notes? And also you can, you can play with it too. Do you want to, ah, uh, you know, we say, well, but wouldn't it be really, but, but what if it, if we, if, if, if we go up a half, half, half step, Oh, that sounds kind of cool. That still works. But Metzger, that D that you were singing, that don't work. I don't know how, how you produce that there. And I get, get a baton thrown at me. 
I like that. And also the, um, the way that that makes it a multiplicity, right? Like a movie multiplicity. Sorry, I'm not meaning to be rude. I just have a lot going on in the background that I don't want to expose oh, to. You could not be rude. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. I like that answer that, that um, you hear it by the, but then it would take practice and like enculturating into it, right? Uh, yeah. 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 And it's not something that necessarily comes with, 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 with everyone. There is a way of once you, there's, there's a kind of musical knowledge that you either invent or bless their hearts, they try to teach you in ear training and sight singing. Lots of smart people have failed that course. And it's a, it's a for, for music majors, first semester and second semester. You got it? No, sorry. But then they say, oh yeah, but this piano course, that can help you too. So you'll take that. Uh, if, but if so, if you take your, your the piano course and you take the sightseeing and you take the music theory course, right? All to do what? Hear your part. <laughs> and th there's some folks who can, they just hear it. It just um, sounds right. Um, but but that raw talent, it's it's developed in in that educational system that that you know if you've had you know the if you take the the music theory courses i mean there are some staunch arts and letters folk who want to just sing they take that course and they'd say if i wanted to take calculus i'd be in, you know i'd be an engineer If you stop and think about sound being vibration back and forth within a certain range, and I've always I used to question whether people really had perfect pitch. You know, why can somebody produce a perfect C or a perfect A? Or no, they actually can hear it. They can. They can hear it. Because I've known many people who had perfect pitch who were always flat when they actually sang. When they actually tried to do Sit it. Sit next to one. <laughs> when, I, you know, a year and a half ago, I sat next to one. The very idea of it, you know, something is moving and it makes something in here move in a corresponding way. The whole thing is very unlikely. But there's also then a pattern to the, these vibrations because it's, the, and also do you want to think about music as points? Do you want to think about it as, as a wave or do you want to think about it as a field? You know, right. pulling right. up the old, uh, what is it? Particle wave field heuristic. Yeah. 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 Music then, brings them all together. It's almost as if the point, you don't have the point if you don't have the wave in the field. Yeah, and, and, and basically, basically, we're we're back to we're well, we're back to mathematics and physics. That's a physics metaphor, right? The particle wave field heuristic. It is. Yeah, yeah. I also just I, you know we've got about five minutes left, but go, you talk about the number in and of themselves, which is what Plato does in that Socrates says there. I keep coming back to that numbers become our signifiers, um, and signify that. To speak of numbers in and of themselves is to speak of signifiers, period. Um, and I'm also recall, and I don't know how to put these together though, but then um, is it Lacan, the signifier is a signifier for another signifier. He says the subject is a signifier. Subject. Signifier. Okay, yeah, we're, we get, there is, the, the, yeah. The so-called subject, with the S bar is always three. Right, yeah, where we don't, there is no, Yeah, so I mean, if you link that to mathematics, I would say the question is, is, ma is a mathematics manipulation of signifiers or, and or a manipulation of subjects? Yeah, or is there a manipulation of subjects? Is there subject matter? 
I get might be another way of putting it, right? Or is there only signifier? Or yeah. Well, I wouldn't say only a um, signifier. I mean, I would answer that it's both signifiers and and subject matters. But, but what it also uh, suggests to us, that, and this is what makes I think mathematics really interesting, it's also those M and M's. It's also those collections of objects. I, and I'm thinking of, you know, Cantor's discussion and proofs for different kinds of infinity. Mm -hmm. I mean. They start out where he's just drawing, he's just, it's like little circles, little M&Ms. And, and then he's using this, this um, leashing function to say, you know, that, that sets are of equal length if you can draw a leash between one element in a set, in one set to another element in another set. Mm -hmm. And then, then he then he plays that with then with moving from that he he, talk, he ends up intru introducing numbers and then he draws these diagonals and suggests that one set is a different kind of infinity than than a, another set because the diagonal in this one infinite set would not appear in this other set. Therefore, there has to be at least one other element. So there are an infinity of infinite sets too. But, yeah. And there's yeah. Natalie. I mean, yeah. There's that connection too uh, uh, with what Rose put in the in the chat. And I know we have to stop here soon, don't we, Natalie? Yeah. She's yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, Two thousand one Space Odyssey. There's mm -hmm. the that sort of uh, high pitched, we can call it music at the beginning, and then it, you know it it recurs at certain points where there's a certain and, it, and it's there again at the end, where it's this vibrate it's, it's it's a vibration, mm. yeah, that first appears with the obelisk, yeah, first appears with the oh. obelisk, yeah, 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 exactly, yes, yeah. I'll be thinking about the relationship between. Uh, Christopher's modalities and David's maths, whether yeah. those, that, that the, the ability to, to tra transition seamlessly from the, the yummy units, the, the M&Ms to whatever thing is existing. But uh, on that note, I stole the last word. I'm very sorry. I do have to kick you all out. Again, all of these conversations can keep going in wonderful ways. Um, Patrick, please, uh, you know, finish it up as you'd like, but, uh, we do have the mingle function, which you're welcome to use under the same uh, menu that gave you the agenda to know how to get here today. You can go sit at a virtual table with folks and keep talking. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Okay, it's thank everyone of, for coming. It was a great, great session, I thought. Yeah. Good, Roberto, good. it was nice meeting you. And we yeah, didn't nice get to talk to you, Patrick. I thought, I loved your paper. I mean, I, I'm going to have a copy of it because you you capture the uh, the Thytacus. I try <laughs> ways. You capture details of it in ways that my my, my paper didn't. Yeah, we yeah. are really good. We need, we need to re reread it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we can do that. Okay. Yeah. Nice Great. meeting you. Nice meeting uh, all of you. Thank you. Nice you. Uh, you, you all take care. care. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye -bye.